Welcome to the How HR Leaders Change the World podcast. I'm your host, Cecilia Crossley, and each week we explore how the work of HR leaders is also creating positive social change, contributing to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, goals which the world's companies are increasingly understanding the urgency of achieving and investing in the action required. If you'd like clear, actionable ideas for how you can use the power of your role to affect change in your company, you're in the right place. Following a corporate upbringing, I founded The Social Enterprise from Babies With Love. We provide services to HR leaders, and through this work, I realised that HR professionals and social entrepreneurs are working in the same areas, albeit in different ways. So we created this podcast to share knowledge on steps we can take through the work of HR. In my opinion, if you're an HR professional, you are also a change maker. And this podcast will provide you with examples of how, by sharing the successes of some of the world's most inspiring HR leaders, you can frame your work in the context of positive change, implement brilliant ideas, and feel absolutely wonderful about doing so. An enormous welcome to Virginia Herlihy, founder of How Do You Do It? to How HR Leaders Change the World. Welcome, Virginia. It's wonderful to have you here. I am a huge fan of your work. We're from Babies with Love are a huge fan of your work. And um, I'd love to ask you to introduce yourself. Thank you, Cecilia. It's lovely to be here. And we're a great fan of your work, too. So the feeling is entirely mutual. Um, so as Cecilia said, I'm, I'm Virginia Herlihy, CEO and founder of an international coaching consultancy, How Do You Do It? We work with our clients to help them retain, engage and support working parents by supporting them to make work and family work. And um, I feel like I have two homes. I'm based literally on two sides of the world, Sydney, Australia, um, which is where I am currently and where we work across Australia and the Asia pack. As you, I hope, can still hear from my accent, I am a POM. Um, and I always wanted to have the business set up in Europe, too, in England too, and we work across Europe. So we're pretty broad in our, our focus. In terms of me particularly, I'm a highly experienced senior executive coach. I'm a speaker, panel facilitator, and passionate advocate for gender equality at work and, importantly, at home. In Australia, I'm part of a prestigious group of female leaders called Chief Executive Women, And our members are very passionate about women leaders enabling women leaders, which is our mission. And I'm also part of a philanthropic women's giving circle called Global Global Women Leaders, which has seen me in Geneva working with working parents of the International Red Cross and providing one-on-one coaching pro bono for senior women in charities. That's amazing, Virginia. I didn't know that about your work with the Red Cross. And obviously, I love that. I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts today because, you know, as you described, you're an HR leader in yourself. And also in your work, you advise and support so many other HR leaders. So it's going to be fascinating to learn from your breadth of experience across the profession. So with that, I will lead us into the first question that we ask, which is an HR leader whose influence creates social change, what do you feel has been your most impactful action to date? Yeah, okay. So this one was very easy for me in terms of the fact that I set up this business in the first place. And it's important because I set it up in 2006 at a time when support for working parents was not strong and working fathers were rarely even considered as part of the parenting equation. Um, So I remember people saying to me, well, I can understand you supporting working mothers, but why are you doing things for working fathers? That was literally how this started. So this is a business that we cater to both working mothers and working fathers. And that was risky in the eyes of some, but absolutely necessary in mine if we're going to create social change here. So I could see that unless fathers were able to be active as parents and important, enabled to be so by their employers, Mothers would remain the default for everything to do with care and fathers would remain the default for everything to do with paid work. And I could see that mothers needed to support to actually be able to move forward in their careers in spite of judgments from others based on traditional stereotypes. So I'd say that the thousands of working parents we have now worked with in different parts of the world are testament to the fact that and worked with by by our expanding team are testament to the fact that that has been a significant change and contribution we've made to to working parents wanting to navigate both. And um, 
across all the CHROs that you work with and what could be next in the journey that you've been supporting them on and, on and are taking the, you know, the world of work on, what do you think is the most exciting opportunity ahead for the HR profession to change the world? Okay, so making hybrid working a norm, it's a game changer. And I think that uh, the pandemic has brought us many negatives, but the silver lining um, of the pandemic is it's brought us an opportunity to really challenge and look at the way that we work in a way that we would have been waiting years to achieve had it not happened. So it's kind of fast-tracked, if you like, the agenda on flexible and hybrid working and people working from a range of locations, focusing on outputs versus visibility, um, and and making, uh, which is so important for the kind of audience that we work with in terms of having more flexibility to be able to navigate how they navigate their career and their family. Now, what's critical here, though, is that that people don't try and revert. We're still hearing stories of people reverting to the old norm, like waiting for this to pass and then we can get back to business as usual. But for the most part, people recognize that we don't have a business as usual from the past. We're creating the next one. And I think what's critical for HR leaders to do in this space is to be doing everything they can to facilitate a smooth introduction of hybrid work in all its many forms in the different teams in their organizations and supporting the managers who are carrying the lion's share of that load. Because in our experience, there's a great deal of inconsistency across managers, both in terms of attitude and ability to do this well. Um, Some do it brilliantly, some really don't. And they need help with how to navigate this because they're feeling under quite a lot of pressure to make it work and they need support on how to make it work. So I think that's that's a really big opportunity for the way in which we work and therefore for people being able to integrate their lives and their work in a way they've never been able to do before if they're properly supported and the managers are properly supported to support them. Mm. And are you already recommending best practices on how to go about that? Uh, The new ideas and new ways, um, do you already have a view on what they are? Yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, part of them in in the chief executive women that they've just our our, our research partners at Bain and Company, and they've just re, re, um, re, released them a, a report called Equitable Flexibility. Um, and I'd suggest that you know, your listeners, if they're interested in that, look that up because it's it makes suggestions about particular areas that companies and organizations should be looking at to be introducing equitable flexibility. So there are a whole range of suggestions they make there, but just to name a few, um, that you're making flexibility part of the norm and done at scale versus in small pockets that uh, flexibility is accessible to all groups and and, me- and so therefore measuring your data to see who's taking it up and who isn't because if only one gr- group or kind of people is are taking it up, that's not very inclusive. Um, and one of the key things that pe- people are needing to do here is be data-led. Too often we're opinion-led in these things, what we think we're doing well or what we think we're not doing well or what we think about people taking it up is very much based on stories we've heard. This is an area where, like in the rest of our business, we need to get focused on measuring the data. What does the data say about who is doing what in terms of flexibility? Which groups are we picking up? Which groups are we missing out? And then, of course, role modeling flexibility from the top is a key one because no matter how much you talk about Um, flexibility being okay in your organization. If people can't see the leaders doing and and sharing stories about how they manage flexibility themselves, nobody really believes it's possible. So that's just a name but a few. Thank you, Virginia, for sharing those, for highlighting those particular, you know, practical things that people can do. And we will reference that Bain & Co report in the show notes for this episode. So it's easy for everyone to go and have a look and um, have that resource available for them. And we know, I know that you are passionate about gender equality. uh, And as you've said, at work and at home, you know, just in life. And, you know, you've given your life in a way to, to working on 
justice of inequality. And I was wondering if you have any other um, examples that you'd like to share of things that you feel so proud of that you've done that others could learn from you and perhaps replicate in their own work and home life about how how we can create change and create a more gender equal world? So that's a big question. And uh, I think where I would like to start with this is always the position of power. And the position of power that you have is your own position. It's what you do. It's what you say. It's what you think. And it's the part you play when you are either party to or witness to what you would consider to be unequal behavior. It's what you do as a bystander when somebody says something that you're not comfortable with. It's whether or not you speak out. And it's what you do in your own life to potentially have um, what can sometimes be uncomfortable conversations in order to address what otherwise will be um, a it will lead to an unfair and inequitable situation. So let me just give you an example of that. So for a couple that is um, going to have a child, having a conversation really about who is going to do what and what are the expectations around that, if that doesn't happen, the data, and I keep coming back to data, tells us that the default position becomes the woman in a relationship. And women bear the majority of both care, uh, child care and domestic, domestic care. And one of the reasons for that, and there are many, but one of the reasons for that is because they don't necessarily challenge that themselves. They accept that position and think that their partner is very good if he's helpful. And we hear that a lot, but we don't hear it the other way around, that, um, you know, that men saying that their, women, their, their partners are very good, they're very helpful. Um, so this is partly the way we've been socialized, but so there's no blaming here, but there is a, and is that okay for me going forward? Or do I need to negotiate a different arrangement where we look at how we share this? So I think there's a lot we can do in our own lives and around us. And in doing that, we start to role model to, to the people that, that we care about, that there is a different way to do this. And I think one of the things I'm proudest of is that I have a son and a daughter. And both my son and my daughter have said to uh, my partner and I that we have been role models for them in the fact that we can have a career and have a family and that we both do both. Yeah, that's wonderful. Last year or 18 months, I don't know, whenever it was, my youngest son said to me, Mum, um, why are only women class reps? And I was just like, oh, my, oh, my, right, okay, we're sorting that out. Dan, sorry, Dan, my dear husband, Dan, you've got to be a rep next year. You're being a rep. I made him be a rep. He was up for it. Um, I didn't force him, but I encouraged him. And um, and the funny thing was, um, in, in my son's class, the teacher was called Mrs. Man. So he is literally the man rep. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. It's this really big deal. And uh, so many of the school friends we've made are like, oh, Dan's so good. All the mum reps are so good as well. It's exactly what you were just saying. One tiny little example from my life. Yeah. And um, interestingly, the quandary I've been thinking around is it's like, well, Dan said to the Parents Association of the school, right, why don't we really set a challenge of having at least one male rep in every year? And I thought, well, why don't we take that further? What about if there's a quota and we progressively, uh, we positively discriminate um, in order to achieve gender balance just in this one small world of class reps right and uh, and then I thought no do you know what will happen we'll just end up with no reps so um anyway it's a silly story but it was just that one example of exactly what you're saying that everyone thinks Dan is really good and if I was the rep I would have just been the rep and um being a rep isn't my bag so I'm not doing it but um but good on Dan and he is good and I and all credit for him for for being role modeling in our family life that it's not just women that class reps, but you know that's just being replicated everywhere, isn't it? In so many small. And that's it. And but these, it's interesting though. You did something about it. You changed that. And as you change that, people will see in your school that there is a a, a man being doing that role, and so it will facilitate the path for other people to do that. Now, if we all did something like that in our own small way, that is quite powerful for other people to see and witness. 
How HR Leaders Change the World is brought to you by From Babies with Love. And this episode is sponsored by our very own Parental Leave Gift Service. We help solve the challenge of connecting with colleagues across parental leave and in returning to work, contributing to talent retention and so too gender balance strategy. From Babies with Love donates 100% of its profits to orphaned and abandoned children. Your beautiful, sustainably sourced From Babies with Love gifts come with the story of how your company is also helping a less fortunate child, creating meaningful engagement. We transform spend that so often already takes place on flowers or products that don't have the sustainable development goals at their heart. We transform that spend to become a consistent, inclusive and strategic part of your working parents programme. Ask us to tell you more at frombabieswithlove.org. Make an impact at a defining moment. Yeah, so, so that's why I say start with yourself. Stop, stop putting the finger out to what everybody else can do. And, and, and this is what, you know, again, talking about HR leaders, we encu- encourage them to do as well. It's like it, it's, it's turning it around to this is what I'm doing to support you, but what can you do to support yourself what, what, what is it that you can say here? What kind of conversation do you need to have? We might need to support you with that conversation, but, but what's your role here? It's like they're the, the taking the responsibility for this versus, oh, I can't do anything to change that. Like if we took that approach, no change would happen. And Virginia, I was also wondering if I could ask you, like we always we have a question about how our guests are driving equity and inclusion in ways that are, are also delivering the business goals. Because we, you know, we know that the commercial drivers will always be imperative, uh, you know, rightly so in, in a business, um, and that sometimes it's challenging to demonstrate a business case, and that HR professionals can come up against some hurdles in getting budget sign off and, uh, and buy in from the whole range of senior executives that they may need it from. And I was wondering if you have any examples of that would be great to share for any of our listeners struggling with that kind of challenge of, of how you've supported um, the HR leaders you work with to ensure that business case is really clear and, and how to go about that and, you know, always enable that sign off to take place and the work to go ahead. Well, it comes back to data again. And it, it does come back to data because you can't argue with data. And what you'll have otherwise is a lot of people who have opinions that think things are actually fine and they might be to some degree, um, but you need to be looking at the data. And in our experience, what we often find is people have good data and on some very clear areas, like how many females in, are going on parental leave and what, um, how many of them come back. And uh, those are, so, so those are some obvious ones. What they have less data on often is men. And what they're doing. So we don't, re- you know, we start. We need to find find ways of measuring our take up of all all the offerings that we have and the return wor- uh, rates for everybody. Because if it, one of the things we're looking at is retention. So if you think about how much it costs you to to re recruit and train, etc., that those data points on retention become very important. So it's the importance of the data on retention, but it's actually also before that that I, I find often the data is missing. It, so we don't actually know the pool we're talking about that we're trying to retain post some kind of transition. And this is where the gender inequity works against men. So that often they don't receive the same level of support that women receive in those kinds of transitions because they don't get pregnant so people aren't really aware of what they're going through, but they need the support as much as anybody else because they're trying to navigate a path that women have already navigated, which is um, getting more involved in their family life and worried about it being a career limiting move and needing support on how to have conversations so that they actually get some support to be able to be the kind of father they want to be. But unless we know who they are and they're speaking up, we can't support them. So that, that investigation of your, what your data is doing and finding out how many people you have in each category, and ju- not just the ones who are obvious, is, is a very important thing to do, I think. Yeah, that's in our experience, 
some of our clients, when they've chosen to partner with us, have said, okay, we, 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 it's easy to do all the maternity leavers um, or adoption, even or fostering leavers, all, all the female-driven types of parental leave, perhaps, or birthing parent types of parental leave. But we don't have complete data on our traditional paternity leavers. So what do we do? How, how are we going to make sure they get there from babies who love gift from us? You know, And um, what I've said and what has transpired to be the case is, well, receiving a gift is a lovely thing. It's so simple, right? It's a lovely thing. No one will want to miss out. So use it as a tool to encourage a culture change whereby your traditional paternity leavers ensure that they tell HR that they're taking leave um, and in fact just take the leave full stop you know you hear in some companies that they don't even necessarily take it um, even if it's just a few weeks you know the statutory amount or what have you so um, in a very simple way um, and not a foolproof way but certainly in a helpful way it's contributing to improving the data for to measure, you know, who, who are the population? What is the population? Exactly, as you say, that starting point to then ev- even start to figure out about the retention rates, as you say. Yeah, and it's great that you're it's great that you're doing that because people that will be less threatening to people to 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 be um, be measured because of that. But I think that now that people's parental leave um, uh, policies are changing to be more generous. We're opening the door to this, but what then comes with that is really being more active in gathering the kind of people that might be interested in those kinds of leaves and and, and actually initiating the conversation with them rather than we do quite a bit of waiting, waiting for them to come to us if they want something rather than initiating going to them because we're offering it. Um, and, and I think that kind of thing, if we're truly serious about gender equality at work and home, we need to enable more men to spend more time um, at home, not just in the return to work, but post that in different types of flexible work arrangements, as as many women have. And Virginia, between our, our teams and organisations, how do you do it? And from Babies with Love, we're going to create like a one page um, top five tips in, in this space around supporting through in return to work and addressing some of the challenges we've discussed today. And we'll put the link to that up in the show notes as well so that people can sign up to receive so let, you know the top five tips. Let's see how many tips we come up with. Um, but hopefully that will be really useful for people who are working in this area. But we love to end um, it's harder than top five because we just like your very top one specific thing. Just so there is, you know, for people who are inspired by listening to you, an action that they may want to, you know, just to do something to get going in their own uh, work or home life. What's the one specific thing you would love to see all HR leaders and all HR professionals do to make a positive change for the world? Oh, it's so hard, that, isn't it, when you're restricted to one? You never want to be restricted. Never want to be restricted to one. I mean, I, I think um, I've mentioned it already probably a number of times because I'm coming across it in so many um in so many companies and so many aspects of the work, which is really about getting data led. I just think it's an area where we get too much about opinions and feelings and not enough about what is the data actually telling us. Because as we know in companies, what gets measured gets done. And um, I think that if we did more of that and actually spoke from what the statistics are telling us about the movements of our people in, staying out, engagement levels, um, that that it's much harder to argue needing a change against data than it is against a general opinion. And I think companies are doing more and more of this, but I think we could do much better at it. Brilliant. Thank you so much. We have just, you know, raced through and skimmed the surface of an enormous topic, but it's been wonderful to hear your perspective, um, particularly, you know, given the huge change that globally we're going through in our way of working and what that means for how our home life and work life works together. Um, So thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate your time. Absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure, Cecilia. Lovely to work with you on this. I hope you enjoyed this episode of How HR Leaders Change the World. Thank you for tuning in. 
If you have a moment to leave a review, a five star one, please, that would be a huge help to achieving our goal to reach more of your peers so we can all contribute to further and faster positive change. For your copy of the show notes, head to frombabieswithlove.org, where you can also join the How HR Leaders Change the World mailing list. And make sure you don't miss out on future episodes and bonus materials. And for harnessing the power of your role to create positive social change, I'm sending you a jumping up in the air virtual high five. See you next time on How HR Leaders Change the World.